Hi, uh, I am Chris. I am an interaction designer. Uh, I work mostly with government services, building digital services with these lovely people here in Norway. And I'm going to talk a little bit about attention. I'm kind of obsessed with attention. When I was on Twitter, this is now years ago, um, I was called finite attention, like finite, like limited, um, because I have this much attention, and I know that maybe some of you can relate to this. And I know that when we build services and products that are digital, we also really have to take care of people's attention because it wanders, it disappears. Uh -huh. This is the state of events today. I can really relate to this. Everything on the internet has become about, no, no, stop, no, no, please no. I just came to do this thing. And so my opinion is that our attention is being hijacked, so uh, taken from us all the time. And we can't really avoid it because brains, so our brains are usefully evolved to notice when things are changing, uh, this is good, because uh, if, you are, if you think about human history, it was useful to notice that, oh, a predator has come, I should run away, or, oh, food. So these are useful things to notice. But it does mean that our brains are designed or have designed themselves, have evolved to notice things all the time, even if it's not useful. But maybe we can do this, maybe we can learn from this. So um, one of the things that I'm interested in is trying to understand my own attention and what happens to it. I remember that I was in London once. This is not a photo I took, it's from the internet. But um, the situation is the same. I was standing by the road. I was waiting to cross the road. And I noticed that my attention was just I kept looking at the person in front of me, and I didn't, it took a long time, this kept happening, and then I slowly became aware that my attention was just, hey, hey, and what is it? Oh, they have the same bag as me. But this took, like, this happened over several seconds, and I didn't really understand why I kept looking, and then my brain, my brain was like, hello, hello, Interesting, and eventually I caught up and said, oh yeah, same bag, good job, and my brain is like, oh my god. So this happens, like your attention will pull on you. And I think of it very much as like a small child, uh, which is like, hello, mommy, 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 hello, hello. And they just keep, your attention will just keep doing this until you do what it wants. So your attention is really a small child uh, that just wants you to pay conscious attention as opposed to the work that it is doing this whole time. Oh, sorry. Okay, so I guess what I want to communicate, if you take one thing away today, is be a student of how your attention is, is working, because it's working all the time, whether you realize it or not. It's always there. It's always trying to find useful things, and sometimes it will orient you towards the useful things. So I want to talk about three concepts from cognitive psychology. Before I became an interaction designer, I worked in academia. I was an academic psychologist. And I was interested in how vision works and how the brain works um, in supporting visual perception. And I got really interested in understanding how people pay attention, because I would do, in uh, my academic life, I would do what I'm doing now. I would stand not with a microphone like this and not with a beautiful uh, salon like this, but uh, I would stand and I would talk to people for maybe two hours. You get like one hour, 50 minutes, and then you have a 10 minute break, and then you do another 50 minutes. And people are like, even if it's interesting, and I tried to be interesting, by the end, people are just like, oh, I want to go home. And I understand that. It's hard to captivate. It's hard to keep people's attention. So I started thinking, well, OK. What are, all these, what are all the ways in which I can hold people's attention? And if you're already asleep, I have failed. I'm sorry. There are about 25 minutes left. So I want to talk first about working memory. And 
this is sometimes, you can call this short-term memory. If you want to start a fight in academia, you say that they're the same. They're not the same. They're almost the same. It's complicated. And this is really just like the number of uh, things, how much new information you can hold in your mind sh briefly before something else happens. And sorry, my clicker is tired. You might think, oh, I can hold loads of information. This is great. But actually, it's oh, wait, more like this. So it's more like you have this kind of working memory capacity, and then like just one thing is, oh, strawberries. Uh, and then everything else falls out. It's a sieve. And a piece of research from, well, a long time ago now, like 70 years uh, almost, found that you can, this, this magical number seven, you can hold maybe seven plus or minus two things in short-term memory or working memory. Let's say short-term for there. And that's great, uh, except that uh, later someone found that maybe seven is uh, an exaggeration. Maybe it's only four plus or minus two. This feels more real to me. And then actually uh, reality shows that, well, it depends. It depends on you. It depends how much you practice. It depends whether all these things are new, whether you can chunk them together and group them together. Uh, it depends on what kind of information. So this is the very... Um, obvious academic uh, excuse. Well, it depends. More research is needed, but it is, it does, sorry. Everybody agrees, though, that the sieve is very small, so we're not holding very much information in that before it falls out. And so let's see if I can make this go. Uh, here is a list of things for you to read and remember. Now, you might be thinking, that's a lot of things. You are correct. It is a lot of things. And the longer I talk right now, the more things you will forget. I could just keep talking, and the number of things in your working memory and your short-term memories is going down and down. Here they are again. How many did you get? Like, did you get more than five? Did anyone get more than five? Oh, good job. Um, more than six? Good. OK. You, 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 and you, you all have a bachelor degree in psychology. Well done. Not really. I'm sorry. So what we find is that um, the information that you store when I give you a task like this, uh, you remember the stuff at the start, and you remember the stuff at the bottom. So this is like the primary effect when you start, and then the recency effect later. And we figure that maybe the early stuff in the list, you kind of you had time to process that and maybe store it. And the last stuff in the list, you're kind of, it's still recent, it's still in the sieve, but it's going soon. Ah, sorry, the clicking is not my friend. Okay, uh, a thing I just want to mention is that sometimes people get really excited about the seven plus or minus or the four plus or minus, and they start thinking it also applies to menus and lists like this, that this is too long. Not necessarily. So because the list is still here the whole time, you can just skim read it until you find what you need. You don't, it doesn't necessarily mean that you, have to, like, um, that you have to have short lists. It's fine. Like now, if I take it away, now maybe you can only recall maybe five things from the list, or more if you're used to that particular menu. Want to talk quickly about cognitive load? Cognitive load is kind of a theory, it's kind of an idea, and it's become very popular in development because we talk a lot about the cognitive load of teams, like how can we reduce teams' cognitive load while they're working, how can we make sure that they can deliver without being kind of um, overloaded by things that they don't need to worry about. And I think a lot about reducing cognitive load for users, so I think, okay, how can we reduce the load on them? Um, where we work in Norway is um, we work for a part of the state, and the users that we have are citizens, and they are really stressed because they need to come and get find um, either a job or get a benefit because they can't work, lots of other things. Not everyone is stressed, but a lot of people are. Not everyone speaks or reads very good Norwegian. So it's really important to reduce the cognitive load on these users so that they can get what they need and find what they need. 
And cognitive load is basically all about working memory. The whole idea of cognitive load is really about how you distribute working memory, how you spend it, where it goes. So almost everything costs working memory. If you can imagine that you have like a small budget of working memory and uh, everything you're about to do is going to cost. Complex information costs more. So here's some simple information. Describe a web page, right? If you imagine this is a task for you, you can be like, oh, OK, a web page. And you can tell me in one sentence, maybe two sentences, what a web page is. But if I ask you then to, um, to describe for me a complex thing, which is like, OK, how does HTML and how does CSS um, and how does JavaScript, how do these all combine to make a web page? And if you tell me that, it's hard for you to generate, it's harder for you to generate that information because there is an interdependency between all these things. And it's harder for me to understand it if I don't know what that is. So here's just the kind of the idea that um, a simple idea is maybe just three things, and two of them like relate to the first one. Complex is where like maybe there are just two things, but B here in that second diagram depends on you being able to understand E and D by themselves, and then also understand the relationship between E and D, and then how that relates to B, how that informs A, and then what does C have to do with this, right? So that's quite a complex setup, but we do that in sentences and information processing all the time. Now I want to talk about attention, which is why you all came, got here. I think people underrate attention and underestimate what it has to do with people's states of mind, and um, particularly people who have different cognitive or emotional needs. You can see from this that it's, we think about, when we talk about attention disorders, we think about ADHD, so attention deficit hyperactivity disorder. But actually, um, there's a lot of mental health conditions, so depression, bipolar, for example, can affect people's um, working memory span, stress, uh, sleep deprivation. So everyone who was out last night and didn't sleep well, um, probably your cognitive capacity today is a little bit lowered, and I'm sure you feel that. Maybe better now, but maybe this morning it was a little bit hard. And so these states, different states of being, uh, whether these are long-term uh, conditions or whether just like brief, uh, maybe you have a new baby and you're just really distracted all the time, it will change your cognitive capacity and it will change the extent to which working memory is yours to do with as you want. So stuff turns up unexpectedly sometimes. Um, new stuff attracts our attention. Photobombing, like the dog, this is great. Um, so uh, this is a great example of attention because everyone just goes, what? Um, so that's how you steer attention. You show new things. You show interesting uh, novel things. Right. Maybe this is what it's like to be you. So this is extra hard, this kind of experience. Like, I think we probably all relate to it a little bit. Um, it's harder, it's even more uh, demanding on you if you have an attention disorder, if you have some kind of cognitive um, condition that makes it harder for you to focus and harder for you to um, exploit all of your working memory. Stress especially can tend to really cramp people's uh, capacity to think for themselves and to step outside um, their normal patterns of thinking and behavior. And new stuff, as you see here, like new stuff that can get in the way and steal your attention is also internal. It doesn't have to come from outside. So uh, right now I'm thinking about, are, are people still entertained? Is this interesting? Oh God, I have a big talk tomorrow. Big talk, not just this, more people. Um, and so my, my, I'm thinking about stuff that is then changing my attention because I should be in the room with you. It would be polite to be here, but it's very hard to always be right here and present without thinking about the future or even the past. Here is a website that my colleagues, I guess, will, uh, will recognize. Um, and uh, this is our website where people come to find out about benefits. And uh, we have this little uh, chat robot in the corner here. And uh, 
then you come to the website and she says, hi, what can I help you with? And then it disappears. And so she's popped up and she's stolen everyone's attention, but like, you get there and the help disappears. And then you're like, wait, why did I come here? And I'm not criticizing the people who made this. They did the best that they can, but I notice sometimes when I use our things, I notice, well, that is hard. Um, and of course, these are people who are already quite stressed. And then one choice they have now, because their attention has been taken from reading the website to over here. One choice that they have now is, oh, well, I'll just chat with somebody. I'm scared. This is scary. But now my attention is here. And then maybe that's good. Maybe they need help, and they should, um, they should chat with us. Uh, but it's, we're asking a lot for them to see that information. Their attention gets captured. Uh, and then they, um, they're just like, oh, what happens now? Because the help, the little help went away. So this and many other things we need to improve. So very important, new information pushes old information off the stack, right? So I said that we have only so much space and then everything kind of falls out. New stuff comes in, old stuff goes out. The good news is that interruption is free. So if something captures your attention, then great, that didn't cost you anything. Your attention just, just does the thing. It doesn't matter. It doesn't cost anything. The downside was that to find your way back to what you were doing before is not free. So you have to finish whatever it was, and then, OK, what was I doing? Yes. And that effort, that time, is um, you can't really not do that. You can't not put that time in. So it's kind of expensive. Like I said, your attention is absolutely free. It can be sent over here, over here, over here by things. But um, you have to find your way back on your own. It's like being driven somewhere you don't know, actually. And then they just say, get out of the car, go home, like that. So probably when this happens, something will fall off the stack because it's just happening all the time anyway. Uh, this is a weather app from Norway. I really like it. Maybe it will animate. There we go. It's kind of nice. It's soothing, right? You can look at the weather. But if I keep talking, your attention is going to keep going back to the screen, because it's a moving thing. And moving things are pretty and interesting and exciting. So please keep looking back at the screen. You can't help it. So movement attracts attention. Changes in animation. So like that movement was nice, and it flowed, and it was kind of consistent, and you knew what you were going to get. Uh, and then this is an animation that uh, I saw, I guess, four years ago. And it's, it's sort of fine, and then it changes direction. And like, this freaks me out. When I first saw it, it was on a web page, and I had to scroll away from the web page. I was just so, oh, stop it, stop it. I can feel it under my skin. And maybe not everybody is, uh, feels this way about it, but ah, oh, ah. Oh. So ignoring motion is really hard. You're spending a lot of um, kind of cognition on ignoring it. And the best thing for me is just to leave the web page or scroll, just hope it goes away. And this is my favorite. I found this recently um, today. I thought, oh, I'll, I'll go and find like some good examples to show you of motion. And uh, I put in Visit Norway, because everyone should visit Norway. It's beautiful. And I found this. I got sent to the Dutch version of the Visit Norway site. This is a ride. So I was like, well, maybe I'll just get rid of the cookie. Maybe it will stop if I dismiss the, the cookies. <laughs> it just keeps going. <laughs> it's just amazing. <laughs> like, is it me or is this really fast? And then because I was sitting, I was looking at this on my laptop, and my laptop was here. It was like being in an IMAX. <laughs> I was just like, whoo! <laughs> it's very exciting. Now, I kind of love this. I'm not saying don't have autoplay. Well, I'm saying ha don't have autoplay on your website for accessibility reasons. But I'm not saying don't make big, exciting, animated web pages. But just please, please give me the choice to turn it off. Because this was a bit too much, honestly. I was just like, oh, I'm too excited. Yes, I'm going to visit Norway, but now I need to sit down. This is actually a 
kind of a better, this is intentionally better in a way. This is uh, Joe and the Juice. I don't know if you uh, know this chain. They have coffee, they have juice. It's a thing we have quite a lot in, uh, in Scandinavia. And um, I thought this was kind of an interesting problem on their website, which won't play now. Or will it? Oh, yeah. There, a little thing just slid in at the top. I don't know if you saw it. And so I thought, well, I'll scroll. OK, let's have a look at this. And now uh, you can see that as you scroll, some of the panels animate a little bit, like kind of when you put the mouse over. And that thing comes out with the photos. So this is all going on. And then if you notice in the, cor in the corner down there, there's a tiny little accessibility thing. And you have an option to turn off animation. I thought, oh, that's really cool. That's nice. That's helpful for people with attention troubles. But then I went back, and all that changed was like it was just really jerky. Like the stuff still animates when you move the mouse over it. But like it, now it doesn't look pretty. Um, so this is like, for me, this is like halfway good. I really I applaud the intention. I think that's great. Uh, but I would like to see just completely static, I think. But I love that they've employed this thing, and uh, I think it's really nice. I just wish it would work a little bit better. So please enjoy animation responsibly. Uh, like they say sometimes on bottles of alcohol or whatever, please enjoy responsibly. So please enjoy animation responsibly. And um, think about, like, could, could we turn this off or could we make it an option to turn it off, perhaps? Paying attention also costs working memory, to come back to that. Um, so we talk about paying attention, like literally, like money. We pay attention. And after a while, I don't know if you're looking at your watch about now and thinking, well, the party is soon, right? Um, or at least coffee or something. Um, it, the longer this goes on, the harder it is. So the more you have to pay. Um, and that, it can feel like a long time. I'm sorry, I'm really, I will be finished soon. No, I'm just kidding. Well, I'm not kidding. I really will be finished soon. But People talk about multitasking, and um, people are like, oh, I'm a multitasker. You know, I, I just do all this thing. But actually, it requires a lot of attention management, and that costs as well. It costs working memory. So what you're actually doing when you're multitasking, right, is you're, you have task one and you have task two, and then you have to remember that both of these tasks are operating, and then like, you have to manage the conscious switching from task one to task two, and you also have to manage like thinking about, oh, where was I with that other thing? And this is a lot, right? So you're asking your brain to do a lot. And the more you are asking your brain to coordinate all this, the less you actually have for doing the thing. So you really only have so much working memory. And when you steer your attention, your working memory is paying for that. Right. I made a web page because I have opinions about things and I could not find a good example, so I just made you a pretend web page in Keynote to illustrate my point. It's really annoying, like all the time you're just you're using these web pages and you're like, oh, this is so annoying, but can you find it when you need it for a presentation? No. So here's one I made. Okay, so uh, we see a lot of these, I guess, in government, but other places too. Please fill out this form, okay? I fill out the first field, fill out the second field, fine. Uh, let's continue. Oh, okay, no, let's not continue. Let's, uh, let's add a thing. That was easy to miss. Okay, let's add some things. Choice one. Choice three looks good. Okay, I'm happy with that. Those are my choices. All right, save. Did my choices save? Who thinks they did? Who thinks they didn't? Well, you're both right, sort of. <laughs> so where I expect information to come about saving um, is here, right? Like the success of this mission uh, is, should be over here somewhere. Uh, but it's not always there. I see places where um, you've, you've done a um, you sort of handling. Goodness, sorry. Uh, you've, you've performed some action. You've done a, a kind of um, a task. Uh, and then the result of the task is not where you expect it to be. And I've closed that modal now, and I'm, well, did it save? And actually what happened is that some of it saved up there. So like uh, there's a little tag there now that says, yeah, you saved thing one. But then underneath that, there's a warning that says, yeah, but th thing three, not so much. So um, I guess the 
sometimes what I see on the web is that people are not thinking about um, what, what is happening with your attention. So they're thinking about, OK, we need a form design, and we need everything to go, and we need it to start here and finish here. But attention kind of, um, it can be spread. And when you have something like a modal that pops up, when it disappears again, uh, everything is reset. So this is kind of a really important principle, actually, is that this thing called in inattentional blindness. And all it really means is that, like, for a moment, something is happening, and you kind of lose focus on the small details. Uh, this is also a, the thing I showed you earlier before is also um, it generates inattentional blindness, because while one thing is happening, something else is happening. You can't really pay attention to both. Like, you will go to whatever just moved, but if two things are happening here and here, you will miss one of them, because you just can't catch up with everything. And so I think when we design things like forms, we spend a lot of time um, making the forms and making them beautiful, but not necessarily uh, enough thinking about where people's attention is at any one time. And you might be wondering, well, OK, how, how do you remove items from the stack? Well, um, one answer is you just wait, uh, because things will fall out. This part of the sieve, like, just wait long enough, it's all gone. That's easy, that's free. Uh, but the other option is you can do something with it, so you still have stuff for a short time. And um, I like to think about this as hanging decorations on a Christmas tree. So if you think about, like, whatever you know about this thing from before is the tree, and then if you have new information, you can hang it on the tree. But if you don't know anything about it from before, you have no tree, and there's nowhere to hang the information. So all everything that you take in that is new is only as good as what you already know before. If you can't hang the thing on the tree, if you don't understand how to hang it or where to hang it, it will go. It will just fall out. If you have a really little crappy tree, then this is what will happen to you. It won't be, um, this is like lack of prior information or at least not very good prior information, or you just don't understand the idea very well. So it's only as good as the tree, if you like. Storing information in memory also is not free. The act of getting it into memory is not free. It costs working memory. If you've ever tried to get a sleeping bag into a tiny, tiny pouch, you understand that effort is required, right? You have to work. Same for cognition. If you want stuff to get off the stack and into your long-term memory, you have to work. You have to spend uh, working memory on it to do that. And while you're spending that working memory, it means you're not paying attention to something else. It would be like if you were trying to pack the sleeping bag away and uh, someone is also asking you to tell them your phone number and what time you're uh, at home tomorrow. It's just not going to happen. So it costs, to connect new, sorry, it costs to connect new information with old information. You have to pay that tax, if you like. I want to talk quickly about some tricks for um, steering attention that are not about dynamic, that are not about animation, because I think that's also useful. Um, I think, particularly if you're a developer, the temptation is to think about things that move and things that animate. But lots of things are just static, and it, it's still like stuff in the front end doesn't have to be moving to be, um, to be able to capture attention. Right? It works on most people, I think. The order is right. It's amazing. So content design, uh, which this is a good example of, is a real thing. Um, reading direction is also a real thing in uh, English, Norwegian, European languages generally. We read left to right, and we start at the top, and we read downwards. Um, it's slightly more complicated for web pages, because there's stuff everywhere sometimes, but that's the gist. Other languages, other cultures do it differently. But design for this if you're working in these languages. Ink also has gravitational pull. Like I think of um, ink, I just mean digital ink. So I mean pigment, I mean anything that looks dark or strong on the page. Or if you have a dark page, anything that looks light. So things that are different are going to capture attention. So if I make this circle just a little bit darker, you see it has more pull. If I change the order of the circles now, this is really interesting for me, because when I look at this, I'm like, I'm reading left to right, but then I come back again for the big circle, because that's where my attention is going. It's kind of, I'll get to the end of the sentence, but then I come right back again. And so that distinction, right, between kind of that, where you end up 
at that side because you're reading and then the circle is right there. To me, that is a different attentional experience than doing it the other way. This is the kind of thing I sit and think about. I'm sorry, this is pretty nerdy at this point. You see attentional pull used in newspapers very effectively. So another thing I like to do is just really compress the resolution of something and then look at, well, where is strongest, right? That's really good and strong. The picture in the front is good, but look at that dark. Like, that's amazing. I'm going to look there. Uh, we also see this. So I worked before on some government websites in the UK, and um, they, have this, uh, they have this button. The button is really good. The button is too good. People just go straight to the button. They don't read anything else. Um, it's a, a great call to action, but like we had a problem with it because where do you put all the kind of what do you need to know information? If you put it high up the web page, the button is now down at the bottom somewhere, uh, and people have to scroll, and they don't like that. But if you put it just there, and then what you need to know is underneath, people don't read the what you need to know. They're just like, mash the button, mash the button, because it's so good. Design systems are really helpful because design systems help you think about um, weight and, and kind of the, the weight of ink on the page, if you like. So this is from our design system at Nav. Um, and this is a primary button, and that's a secondary button, and that's a tertiary button, and the weighting is lovely. If I have an issue with the tertiary button, it's because it doesn't look like a button. There's no clue there to indicate for accessibility that it's actually clickable. But um, the, the weighting is really nice. Sometimes uh, we use this badly, we, people on the internet. Um, accept all is very often the kind of the heavy call to action. That's where all the weight is, right? Um, you can set your choices, but everyone knows that's going to take you to another page. Don't have time for that. And then down at the bottom, do not accept. Tiny. They didn't even give it a big D. Just so small. So that's kind of naughty. I found this also. This is another U UK government web page. I'm kind of impressed by this. Like, I, I don't think anyone there set out to make this extreme kind of racing car stripe madness. Um, but it, I think this is honestly just because there are a lot of people working on these services, and maybe no one took the time to look at the whole thing because everyone's very busy building services. It happens a lot. We do it in our organization as well. It's totally understandable. But sometimes it's also just useful if someone comes along who's not stuck in that perspective and just goes, do you know that your front page is like eight different stripes? This is my favorite game. Again, this is just attention management, right? We like pictures. Same thing. Images are basically almost free. Your visual system is so quick to process images that it's, um, it's just easy. And you should think about where the text is because of that, because your attention just glides right through the image. Boom, done, thank you, and then read the text. If the text comes first, and I wish I had a picture of this, actually. If the text is over the image, sometimes you won't really read the text. You just want to look at the picture, because the picture is big, it's colorful, it's interesting. But what happens if you're blind? Because all of these things I'm talking about right now um, happen. I'm talking about visual attention a lot. And um, visual is like three dimensions and time. So if I want to read something on the web, um, I can just kind of go wherever I want. And then if I miss something or I want to reread, I just go right back and I carry on. And it's all really fast. But if you're using like a screen reader, if you're blind and you use a screen reader or audio stuff, you have one direction. That's it. It just starts, and then it plays, and then it stops. And you can rewind. It's kind of an effort, though. It's not like vision. And you only have one dimension. You're just going along this, this um, train track. And so Nielsen Norman um, described this as the pinball pattern of like um, not audio, but for visual people, just look everywhere. Like You can take a complex website, and people will just be all over the place. But if you're a screen reader user, you don't have that option. Uh, and so I looked at your, one of your papers here. And um, 
what would happen to me as a sighted user, I'd probably get very excited about the picture on the front there, and maybe I'd look at the story, and I'd be like, oh, I don't want to read about Russian gas and oil. Um, so then I would maybe like look over here, because, oh, that's got something in English that's interesting to me, and I can understand it. Um, if you're a screen reader user, you're going to have to go through this more methodically. There is no skip. There is no, oh, shiny picture. I wonder what that story is about. You can't do that. You go through the title, the H1. You probably go to the first H2, right? And you're like, oh, Russian, no, I don't want to read about that today. Maybe you'll look at the alt text, if there is an alt text for the picture. Then you're into the first H2, um, or the sorry, the, maybe the second H2 at this point, and you read that. And then maybe you look at the third one, and everything is very sequential. There is no skip. And so you don't know like where is interesting. You just have to work through it. Um, but you don't even know how far forward to skip, right? If I read something a minute ago, I'm like, oh, it was just there. And I can send my attention back there. Or, oh, that looks interesting before I've read everything else. But a, a screen reader user doesn't even know, like, where. Is there interesting stuff here at all? I just have to go through it in linear flow. So I guess what I wanted to say about that um, with attention um, is that, oh, sorry, I'm getting ahead of myself. Um, the same with visual attention. Uh, attention jacking works just as well in an audio way. So like, if something happens in here, there's like a bang or whatever, kind of people will notice, right? And you will forget for just one instant what you were thinking of, what you were doing. And then you'll reorient. The instant attention is free. The reorientation will take more. It will take longer. So my tips, really, for, um, for screen readers and thinking about attention uh, is get to the point. Like, don't spend a long time wasting people's time with like long H1s, long H2s, and stuff. Like, they just want to skip. I have colleagues who use screen readers, and they're just they go super fast, but they just skip, 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 skip until they find what they want. And it also means you should prioritize carefully. Like, if you know most people are gonna um, read a piece of content, put it near the top, unless there's a really compelling reason not to do that. Don't make people go all the way through like the alphabet or whatever. Be kind. And then also don't autoplay stuff, because if I, as a screen reader user, if I open a, like, a new tab and it just starts playing video, I've forgotten what I came here to do. I'm scrambling around trying to find the controls to turn it off. And now I've just, you know, I've forgotten what I wanted to do. Everything has dropped off the stack, and I'm cross. So um, think really carefully about what you're asking people's attention to do uh, for screen readers as well as for sighted users. Good news, briefly, if you're blind, you might have slightly better working memory. There are some studies that suggest that maybe um, your, your working memory is kind of extended by uh, the situation, but uh, not all studies agree, um, more research needed. Very typical academic uh, result. And I just want to end with this because I love it. I don't know if anyone's seen this. Uh, this is a website called um, howiexperiencewebtoday.com. I'll just play this for you. This is amazing. Yeah, so um, this is like a thing that manages to do about all of the attention things that we've talked about today, and it is just awful um, <laughs> and amazing. So uh, please look that up, share it with friends, because I think it, it like sums up very nicely uh, everything that I, I have strong opinions about. Um, and I think that's me, really. Thank you. Thank you.